Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three. What other? Which one?
See Ambassador you. Wayne, why don't you sit over there? At the end? And Bambi, why don't you sit there? Okay. Jason, sit next to me. You can kick me if I... <laughs> Wrong. You fall asleep. Right, I fall asleep. Uh, okay. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair at, here at CSIS. Uh, we're having a conversation about Afghanistan's <laughs> development outlook for the next decade. We're doing this uh, in the context, in the run up to the Brussels donor conference for Afghanistan next week, uh, which is being hosted both by the Afghan government and the European Union. Uh, I think we're, we've got a very interesting uh, set of panelists to, um, to talk about this. I think um, the, there's a lot of attention in Washington about the security issues in Afghanistan. Uh, I think my view is that security can basically hold things constant or improve the security condition, but ultimately you have to improve the situation on the ground in terms of social progress or economic progress. And ultimately, there's not going to be enough assistance, foreign assistance, from the donors themselves that ultimately it's going to be in partnership with, with a capable government and, a, and an active private sector. And so I think we're going to be talking about the ways in which, in, a, in the context of holding security the same and with, uh, with resources from the aid world, how can we change things on the ground? I think there's been significant progress that doesn't get half the attention it deserves in, in Afghanistan. And I think one of the, uh, the question I think we should be asking is, is are we prepared to walk away from the gains? And you know, because I think there's, you know, I think there's lots of grumbling in Washington, and perhaps even a possible, you know, Afghan fatigue. And I think the question is, that I, I think it's completely unacceptable to have uh, uh, a situation where we walk away from Afghanistan. So I think uh, that's that's the reason I wanted to convene this conversation and to have a, a, a thoughtful conversation based on that context. So. Uh, we've got some very thoughtful folks. I'm going to turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, Ambassador Tony Wayne, uh, who served in Afghanistan. He's a senior advisor here at CSIS, and he'll introduce the rest of the panelists. Ambassador Wayne. Thank you, Dan. It's a thanks to all of you for coming out early and being with us here. Um, it, it really is a very important uh, discussion that we have. Um, I think we can look at Afghanistan and should as a very important part of this generational uh, work that we're trying to do against violent extremism uh, in many parts of not only Afghanistan's region, but much more broadly. And in the government of Afghanistan, we do have a, a, a willing partner to Absolutely. work with us and a partner that is committed to reform. Um, as part of what we'll talk about, it's clear that we have to see those reforms implemented well and yeah. delivered, and that is both the government and donors agree on that. Making that happen is not as easy as many of us would, would hope. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in development and in, de and in improving governance, but good things are happening, as Dan said. And we're very happy to have with us today Ambassador Hamdullah Mohib, who uh, is representing Afghanistan here very ably in Washington um, and is, uh, is very uh, well connected with uh, President Ghani and with the government and uh, in constant uh, uh, discussion with him so he can, he can share with us uh, those, the thoughts and plans that will be present, not only that, that, that are ongoing, but will be presented next week in Brussels. Um, James Foley, Jason Foley, excuse me, Jason, is here representing uh, USAID, which remains one of the largest uh, uh, development donors in, in Afghanistan um, and um, has a wide range of programs that they've been working on, uh, has increasingly moved to have more of those programs uh, done in cl very close cooperation with the government of Afghanistan and more funding flowing through the government of Afghanistan. Uh, we also have uh, Bambi Arellano, who uh, was one of my successors in Kabul and is also a career USAID development officer um, and uh, oversaw on the ground in Kabul the, the efforts of the United States to provide that that kind of governance and development assistance that is so important. And so she will have a very uh, important perspective uh, from that, that time. So I hope we can talk a little bit about the, the current 
challenges, the current situation, the hopes for Brussels for next week, and then the important agenda ahead. As Dan indicated, there, there has been and there will be debate in the United States about the degree of commitment um, that the United States should continue, especially with the new president coming together. Uh, I was fortunate to join a number of former ambassadors and former commanders and other experts looking at this recently. And um, we all clearly came down on an enduring commitment to Afghanistan, but one based on a set of mutual commitments between Afghanistan and the United States and its international partners as we go forward. And um, part of that, a, a big part of that, was mm -hmm. looking at the role of Afghanistan as a crucial pillar um, in this ongoing work that we're doing all over the world with partners um, to combat violent extremism. So, um, should we start with yes. the ambassador, please? Yes. Ambassador, please. Please. Okay. Um, well, first of all, let me thank you for hosting this panel to CSIS and Dan for you. Um, I know it's an early morning commitment to all of you who are here this morning. It shows uh, w what an interest Afghanistan still has in the amount of committed friends that Afghanistan has, which, is, um, um, w which we consider ourselves to be um, an asset to us. Um, I want to, um, to, to begin with just to, to discuss what we're ho hoping to, uh, to achieve from Brussels. We'll be going to, um, to, to the conference uh, by presenting <coughs> what um, a set of achievements that were um, discussed at our um, self-reliance agenda uh, in London two years ago. We'll be going to set some of those indicators and see how far we have come. Um, because it's, imp uh, it, it's important, as Dan mentioned, that there, that there are a lot of questions. Most of what we hear in the news um, is, uh, is about security situation and, and not necessarily about all the progress that the government um, has been able to, uh, to, achieve, uh, to make despite the challenges that we have had. Um, these will be um, uh, in, in line with what our donors, which um, had al also agreed to, so it will be on mutual accountability and what we have mutually set to, to achieve. And going forward, what would be the goals for the Afghan government in the next three to five years on what we hope to be able to achieve and, and, and where, where, we are, um, where we will see ourselves as a government and collectively as a community and with our donor partners um, on w how far we will be able to, to get them there. Um, yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Jason. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, very glad to be here on the panel with these distinguished guests to talk about Afghanistan's uh, important future. Uh, before I get into the um, more meat of the remarks, just want to mention a, an anecdote by introducing of uh, uh, I attended a business opportunities conference in Dubai last week that the Afghanistan government put on. And it was striking. We had over 200 investors from all over the world, from um, Central Asia, Middle East, Turkey, Europe, and the United States, with real money in hand, wanting to invest in the energy sector in Afghanistan. And you know, we had expected uh, security, right, to be the top of the list of concerns. But it wasn't. It was, how can I get a lower tax rate? Um, now, we are looking with the Afghan government on taxes, but investors say that a lot. We want lower taxes. That's a normal thing for investors to say. And I don't want to leave the impression that there aren't significant problems in Afghanistan. There are. But this uh, conference showed that there are opportunities, that things are beginning to change. So I'll speak a little bit more about that uh, op uh, business conference and, and some of the outcomes. But first, just want to take a step back a bit. And when we talk about the reconstruction in Afghanistan, it's a bit of a misnomer, because there wasn't a real sort of state as we understand it to be reconstructed uh, after the many, many years of, of war. And in fact, the Afghan government and support of the international community were starting from scratch, so to speak. And 
over time, the results have been impressive. So I just want to mention a few before we look forward. So first, in 2002, only 6% of Afghans had access to reliable electricity. Today, nearly 30% have access to a grid. The Afghan uh, government, with help from AID, established the country's electrical utility, uh, referred to as DABs. And today, DABs no longer receives a subsidy from the Afghan government. It has been profitable since 2011. When we talk about sustainability, that's a, a great example. We, uh, working with the Afghan government, helped to establish a national health care system. In 2002, just a few Afghans had access to trained health care providers. Today, roughly 60% of the population, population lives within a one-hour walk of a health uh, center. Uh, education, we've helped give millions of children access to the skills they need. According to the Ministry of Education, now over 9 million students have enrolled in school, including nearly 3.5 million girls. And mm. university enrollment in 2001 was 8,000, today 174,000. It's a dramatic improvement. In agriculture, we've facilitated the export of over 45,000 metric tons of fruits and nuts worth over $50 million, and in the process created over 8,000 full-time jobs. We, we've talked a bit about private sector, establishing standard economic rules, and we work with the Afghan government at every level of the economic value chain, from the farmer who learns how to package its produce to meet international standards so it can be exported, to small business owners that want to expand their businesses. Afghan joined the WTO, a huge, huge achievement uh, given what their country allows. Now a lot of uh, room is left to implement that. A lot of laws are being put in place, but it's a, a very important first step and a signal to the international community. So considerable progress has been made. There are a lot of challenges, but to answer Dan's you know, direct question, now is not the time to walk away. And so in Brussels next week, international community and the Afghan government will come together and international community will recommit to Afghan's future development. There will be a platform for the government to demonstrate that in spite of the many challenges, and there are, they have made tangible progress to reform their government and deliver basic services. They'll also c commit to a renewed set of reform benchmarks developed in partnership with the international community to make clear that continued donor support is contingent upon measurable progress. At the conference, the United States will demonstrate our continuing strong support for Afghanistan and will encourage continued progress in economics, good governance, anti-corruption, improve access to education and human rights, including, importantly, the empowerment of women. So there is no doubt that Brussels is a very important gathering. But I think what happened in Dubai is equally as important. Let me provide a few more mm -hmm. tales on what happened there. So the investors were focused on renewable energy, in which Afghanistan has significant potential in solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and geothermal. It has, Afghanistan, the country, has 300 days of daylight. That is significant. And if harnessed, this could power thousands of homes and businesses across the country. We highlighted our work with DABs to award the construction of a 10 megawatt solar power plant in Kandahar. And think sort of many football fields worth of solar uh, panels. To an independent power producer. Right? The first in a series of projects. So we came to the conference with a number of other opportunities and people were interested. The investors also wanted to know about Afghan's five-year energy plan and how to navigate the country's land, tax, and investment laws, and importantly, how corruption is being addressed. And as we sat on these panels, and these investors had questions, in the past, it would be AID that would answer, provide most of the answers. This time, no. It was the Afghan government officials from the ministries, at the ministerial level, the vice ministerial level, senior advisors that were there, engaged, and they were answering the questions. Maybe not necessarily perfect, but perfect in the sense that they showed the leadership and they showed the commitment to their country's future. That's good. So this example demonstrates that despite the insecurity and challenges in empowering women and girls, strengthening the education and healthcare system, tackling corruption, 
Something transformative is happening in Afghanistan. More than ever before, the Afghans are taking ownership and leading their own path. The Afghan National Peace and Development Framework that President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah will deliver at Brussels is an Afghan authored document. The Afghans are not only committed partners, but the vision for the way forward is being led by them. So in conclusion, I don't want to minimize again how, how many challenges remain in Afghanistan. But the 200 investors in Dubai, the thousands of Afghan, Afghans graduating from school every year, and the hundreds of business owners, civil society leaders, midwives, doctors, and teachers who aid supports every day illustrate a simple truth. The country is moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. You're here. Bambi, please. Okay. Well, I thought it would be most helpful for me since I left Afghanistan in 2013 to give a bit of a historical perspective related to the Tokyo Conference and the way the Tokyo Conference may or may not inform Brussels. Um, I would like to start by um, recognizing one of my primary partners post-Tokyo, Amin Habibi, who was here in the front row, who is now um, also in the government in a very important position, and I can't tell you how good it is to see this because, as Amin knows, the conference is one thing. The most important part is what comes after the conference and the way the countries negotiate and make sure that um, the commitment continues under terms that are satisfactory to both sides. Um, Just my dad. So Amin is the Deputy Minister of Finance for Policy and Director General of the Finance Ministry for Policy and Program Implementation. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. We're really pleased you're here. Um, and I know we'll be front and center going forward. Um, I, one of the interesting things for someone like myself who comes out of a very, very long trajectory in development and working in countries very similar to Afghanistan was when I went to Tokyo, which was one week after I had come into the job that Tony described, that Ambassador uh, described, um, was uh, just really realizing how high the expectations were for Afghanistan. You had a country that is, um, if all of you look at the indices, one of 14 countries in the world at the, um, among the low, low developed countries um, that have made the most progress on development as of between um, as of 2012. And Bambi, some of these are like land speed records on development, right? right? In terms exactly. of some incredible improvements right. on unbelievable velocity. But of those countries, and if you look at the list, Afghanistan is really one of the few that has a continuing ongoing conflict. So it had this incredible progress, but the conflict was ongoing. The context for my uh, presence in Afghanistan was the surge and a very rapid desurging. And so really it is that linkage between the surge, desurge, and the development programming that was, um, I considered to be one of my major challenges when I was there. Um, the main thing I think related to Afghanistan, given the amount of money that was going in both on the security and the civilian side, were the expectations. Um, I felt like the expectations for a country like Afghanistan um, really were pegged very, very high. Even though they were negotiated, they were pegged extremely high, even with the full-blown NATO presence in the country. Um, this was my immediate reaction. It was something that I you know, discussed constantly with the Minister of Finance when I was there. Um, but it wasn't only that. It was the unprecedented donor involvement that you had there the unprecedented role of donor financing writ large, but then also how ready was the Afghan government to assume the role that normally would have been eventually divested by the donors to the government and how quickly that could happen. So again, in reacting to Tokyo, and my impression in Tokyo was yes, it was a very, very ambitious agenda, but there, there would just have to be a lot of realism going forward in terms of setting expectations. In terms of what I observed during my time in Afghanistan after Tokyo, um, the change in the drawdown had an immediate impact. Um, I used to sit and look at a chart every day on my office wall, and um, um, you know this, I mean, because you were in charge of many of the, uh, the transitioning of the provinces from NATO security to Afghan security. You would watch areas that had really just were nascent development poles 
suddenly dealing with major security transitions as well. So that very, very rapid transition, much more rapid than originally planned, the impact of that, the fact that you were not able to really re-educate in some ways, that's a terrible word, but I'll use it, um, a private sector that had become used to a level of entitlement under the NATO presence. And once you remove that, it was going to be a very different ballgame for the private sector. So that shift was very, very rapid. Um, and also the shift was even more rapid for the government, for the, not, the civilian side ministries that were going to have to assume a very major role very quickly. So I, I think all of those things um, really had a, a very, very important impact. In terms of the winners, we saw some very, very important local development models coming forward. Jason's referred to some of that. If you look at what's behind the statistics, sector by sector, it really is those provinces where you had a combination of local participation, strong local leadership, and active community commitment to the sectors, be it economic job growth, be it um, uh, education, be it health. So the real winners, I think, for Afghanistan during the time I was there was where you started to see these models emerge. Um, I think it is important that this was, where you saw these winners was on a limited set of things. So really focusing and limiting that agenda going forward, I think, is where you will continue to see those successes. And again, I go back to, you look at countries like Afghanistan, where we've been able to track real progress over the last 50 years, is when they have been able to focus on a limited agenda that allows them to grow um, bit by bit. Going forward, I, you know, again, I go back to limiting the complexity of the goals, making sure that the targets set really are achievable in that sector, in that province, under that type of leadership. Mm -hmm. That is the way that donors are able to market the program and sell the brand of Afghanistan going forward to the people that approve the funding. When you have those very specific uh, examples. Um, I was delighted to hear about the cross-sectoral program that has now been announced because I think in a country like Afghanistan, this is where it really is, where you have multi-sector in a given location that's able to generate that level of, of dynamic. Um, I'll stop there. I do feel that um, building on what, what is working is important, um, knowing specifically what is working. Um, it is some combination of building on the, the macro, which is such a major issue, the budget execution, the revenue increases that the, the country um, has had some real winners in over the recent years, the fact that there has been a li limited uptick in economic growth, building on those winners at the ac macro level, but really from the standpoint of accountability of the government going local and making those local models stronger and better. Right. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Um, let me just, I want to just uh, underline a couple of points, and I, if, if you don't mind, Ambassador Ryan, I wanted to put a question to the, to the group that, that I think would be, I think is something I'm curious about. I just think one of the things we have to understand is that there has been a very important downward trajectory in the amount of treasure that donors like the United States, Japan, my friend from JICA, the Washington rep from JICA is here, uh, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the European Union, a variety of generous donors like Canada, the UK, Australia, Germany, I could list them, there's I think several dozen. Uh, there's, it's gone down over time as the economy, the real economy has picked up and the government of Afghanistan be able to collect taxes. And so as a percentage of the GNP, I think it's on around 20 or 25 percent of the GNP, far, a much, an, inc an, an impressive decrease from when at, uh, 10 years ago when it was much, much higher, multiples of that. Um, I think the social progress, the fact that there were zero, zero girls in school in 1999 or in 2000, and the number that was mentioned in an offhand way was 3.5 million. There were 50,000 or zero cell phones in 1999, maybe there were 50,000 in 2000 or 2001. There's something like 20 million cell phones today. 
the amount of paved roads, the land speed record in all of global development in terms of some of the metrics on things like mother, to, uh, mother, uh, some sort of things like maturity, uh, infant mortality rates, I mean, unbelievable progress of the, uh, in terms of uh, I think the average lifespan was 40 years or 42 years and in 1999 it's now 60. I mean, this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable stuff. And my view is if, I, I can't believe that you know, 3.5 million girls getting two, four, six, or eight years of basic education isn't going to change the, the nature of Afghan society over time. We have to give it time to do that. We're 15 years into a 25-year project. Um, finally, I think the important thing to note here is this is a very cap this is a capable government. Um, there's some very impressive people. Ambassador Mohib is an excellent representative for his country here in Washington. Uh, we've had a series of people come through CSIS recently. Uh, we're very pleased to have Mr. Habibi here. We had Minister Kayumi uh, here the, uh, uh, recently. Just some really impressive, capable people. This is a capable government. Uh, I think uh, Jason's comments reflect that as well, that this is, there is progress being made. Um, yeah, there are some serious problems. We need to have a lot more economic growth. I think there's a very interesting analysis by the World Bank that I, I commend all of you to read that came out, about, I guess, about three weeks ago. I think perhaps in the run-up to Brussels, probably one of the better World Bank products I've ever read. I highly recommend it. I, the title is, I forget, but we can... Uh, we can we can maybe if you we're going to send it to everybody who was an RS, who RSVP to this we'll send you the the World Bank study because I think it's important. Um, but they said that the two drivers for the future are agriculture and mining. I think it would be great to hear from Ambassador Mohib about that. Um, yes, I think the issue of corruption, whether at the regional or national governments, I think is a central problem and it's a tax on private investment. We've written about corruption here at CSIS. I think this is something that is not going away. It was mentioned in the New York Times article uh, this weekend, the op-ed. And then finally, the demographics are such that with the youth bulge, there's a massive youth bulge. It's, uh, and it's actually, it's close to a, you know, a major, you know, could be an opportunity, but could also be a challenge. You want to turn into a demographic dividend, but we're going to need, you can't need to have increasing economic growth in the formal sector, or you're going to have a whole lot of young people who are either available for a whole lot of activities that aren't in the formal sector, and I'll leave it at that. So let me just, I want to put a question uh, to this group, including Ambassador Wayne and including Mr. Habibi. So uh, I want you to think about you are in front of um, Donald Trump's national security advisor or Hillary Clinton's national security advisor or a member of Congress from the second district of West Virginia or from Iowa. And I want you to make the case for remaining involved in Afghanistan over the next, because this is a, we're, we're on the hook. The United States is gonna have to be from a security standpoint, but also from a development standpoint, we're gonna have to be on the hook for probably another 10 years. I think it's going in the right direction. Afghanistan is weaning itself off, off of assistance. As long as we have an uptake in private investment and private economic growth, we'll continue to wean ourselves off of being there in terms of writing aid checks because we want to get off of that. We want to get out of that business. So the the met I need a thir a pithy thirty second message. I want to hear from each of you. I'm going to start with Ambassador Wayne, and we're just going to go down the, the here. And I also want to hear from Mr. Habibi. So if you were in front of a member of Congress who doesn't pay a lot of attention to Afghanistan, and there's perhaps some Afghan fatigue. What is the case you would make briefly in 30 seconds or less to, in simple English, to somebody who doesn't come to think tank seminars, isn't going to read a white paper? So, you know, when I go to see my mom and dad at Thanksgiving in six or eight weeks and they don't pay a lot of attention to this, what's the, what's the case for doing this? Ambassador Wayne, I'm going to start with you. Well, my argument. You can thank me for this later. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My argument would be one based on uh, the security of the broader region and the United States. We neglected Afghanistan in the early 1990s, and we paid a very heavy price for it, as did the people of Afghanistan. At a time when we have violent extremism in many places around the world, and we have a willing partner in Afghanistan and set of partners who are willing to fight for their own rights, but also willing to undertake significant reforms in a difficult situation, we need to stay engaged with that partner, and it's in our interest to do so. Thanks. Bambi? I would just say the historic gains are amazing. 
um, if you look at it comparatively worldwide, um, what's been achieved over the last 15 years. Um, but this is a long haul. And the commitment to meet the national security goals has to be a long haul commitment. OK, Ambassador Mohib, you're asked this every day. So what is your answer? Um, I wanted to, um, to to go back a little bit, yeah. uh, but I will give you so I don't break your rule. I'll yeah. stick to the 30 seconds. Yeah, but sure. Can I go a bit longer. You can go a little bit longer because okay. you're the ambassador. Yeah. Um, well, the, the quick answer is a stable Afghanistan is in the interest of everyone. But I wanted to go back a little bit and I wanted to talk about what, um, what the Afghanistan of today is and what the Afghanistan that we always compare ourselves to 15 years from, uh, uh, from uh, when we first went, when, uh, when the international community went into Afghanistan and nothing existed, to an Afghanistan that is today. I think the benchmark has to move. To, uh, to the Afghanistan of two years ago rather than the, the Afghanistan of 15 years mm. ago. Because we have come a long way. And yes, that progress has been difficult with, this, with a lot of, with a set of challenges. But, but what we managed to do two years ago has been incredible. And that is the definition of what the Afghanistan today is and what, what, we, uh, what, what, what we look forward to in terms of planning. So we went through an economic transition we went through a military transition and we went through a political transition all at the same time. And most democracies fail at the political transition, especially in the, in the countries that have relatively the same sort of history as Afghanistan with, the, uh, w with no democratic past. Uh, no precedence of um, ever changing governments. So what happened in Afghanistan was we did have a democratic transition from one president to another. Now, as part of building that democracy, we had to have the institutions that were all built around one president to move from, from being focused on people to focused on institutions. And, and that transition did happen in that in, successfully at the same time as, as when we were also going through a military transition when we suddenly what Bambi mentioned was from a surge of 150,000, over 150,000 um, international troops to all being the responsibility of the Afghan government and the Afghan security forces who were, who were newly trained and were suddenly put on this huge responsibility. They still managed to make, uh, to keep Afghanistan from, uh, from, from the insurgents whose objective at that time was to take over Afghan uh, territory and, and keep it. We managed to keep them away from that in these past two years. And, and we went through an economic transition where most of our economy was built around the uh, in, uh, security forces or international troops and their presence to shifting from that to building an economy that would be self-reliant, sustainable. In, in these two years alone, now I want to focus on not what we have achieved in the past 15, 15 years, but in just in these two years alone, we, we, we've completed one of the, uh, one of the largest dams uh, for uh, over four decades. Um, two years ahead of schedule, this, this Salma Dam in Herat will irrigate 80,000 hectares of land. That is 50,000 families. It will also electrify 40,000 households. Um, and th that's a huge progress and, and it'll create jobs for people in that area. Um, we just yesterday signed a, a, an agreement with, um, w with a private firm to build uh, another set of, uh, another dam. This would be built by the private sector. In, in this year, we also increased our revenue by 22%. That's tax the, revenue, tax collection tax revenue from the private increase. sector, not foreign aid. This is not foreign. This is just by implementing reforms, by creating uh, better systems to be able to, uh, um, uh, to, to collect the revenue that we wanted. We, uh, we so Ambassador, every dollar of taxes you collect means one dollar less of foreign assistance from your outside donors. Is that correct? The more we collect, the more contribution we can make to our own yep. economy. So okay. um, we, we're a step closer to, um, to implement, so to becoming self-reliant. Um, we have been working on corruption now. Um, I do understand that a, um, one of the biggest challenges that that those who are spreading a lot of negative stories about the government were vested the interest in um, in an economy in an illegal economy of extortion, drugs, and corruption. Um, 
Uh, and we managed to, despite those challenges, despite um, um, those opposition, managed to revive and introduce m and take concrete steps in reforming the economy and reforming the Afghan government and putting more um, systems in place. Um, I think this is this is the Afghanistan that we should be comparing to as we go forward, as we go to Brussels, the Afghanistan of what today is with the achievements and with the, uh, the institutions that we currently have um, to co compare to what we are, what would we, when we had nothing. I think because today we have more, um, we have the institutions that are capable of bringing Afghanistan to the, um, to, to the Afghanistan we want to see. So what you're saying is, is we need, you, you need to have U.S. support and, don and allied support and donor support uh, because you're making progress and you can see five, seven, ten years down the road that we're gonna, you're going to be in an even much better place than you are today. Is that a, that Absolutely. a way to Absolutely. Okay. I think um, to add the, um, the, the, the time period where we received the most aid, uh, from 2007 to um, 2007, 2008 to 2012. Um, during that period, because we didn't have the systems in place, because we didn't have the institutions that we currently have and that, that we've been able to implement over the past, uh, the past two years is that poverty rates went up rather than down by 4% rather than going down by 2%. Which was because, it was because we didn't have the institutions to support it. Whereas today, in the past two years, we've been focusing on making sure that we have the institutional capability to be able to bring Afghanistan to, uh, to its full potential. Okay. Yeah. okay, Jason, so going back to you, you're in front of this member of Congress from the 2nd District of West Virginia. You're in front of my parents at Thanksgiving. You're in front of the National Security Advisor, two of the main presidential candidates. Give, give us the 30-second argument for why we need to continue to stay involved in Afghanistan. So, in simple English. Yeah, so I would, uh, I'd like to argue about the development gains and how important they are, but I wouldn't make that argument. I would make quite simply. You agree with the development gains, but you don't want to, go, you don't want to use that as, the, <coughs> as the, the point. I would say quite simply, you do not want to see another Syria and Iraq yep. and South Asia with nuclearly armed neighbors. Right. So you know, this is a Syria Iraq 2.0. We pull we we pull the plug. We we walk away, and what you're looking at is a potential Syria and Iraq 2.0, right? That's you that gets my what, attention. Right. You don't know what you're what you're facing. Yep. Facing. Okay, Mr. Habibi, thanks for being here. Do we have a microphone for my my friend, Mr. Habibi? Yeah, you have you're you, you're gifted with a large room voice like me, Ms. Rabibi. But I want to get you a, a microphone for our television audience at home. So, all across. This is a family think tank program, of course. So. <laughs> Morning coffee. Okay, please go ahead and stand up and address the audience. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Well, first of all, hi, and good to be here. So I will make it very simple, 30 seconds. So I will make an intro and an extra note. For the intro, we believe that. Uh, is it working? No. Yes or no? No. Is it working now? Does it work? Boy, technology's great when it works. No. Here, here, here's mine. Go ahead, just mine. So that's good. Don't worry about it. We're calling an audible. Go ahead. So that's good. Now it works. So I make it very simple in 30 seconds. So I've divided into extra internal and external. So I believe that uh, we have a track record of achievements. We have a willing partner in Afghanistan that is committed to reforms and also taking bold measures towards uh, self-reliance, which is goal, our goals. I will also make it uh, external. Given the ISIS and some of the fundamentals which where we live in it, I believe it's key to have the continuous support of our partners. I will not make uh, the point raised about Syria that after 15 years with the support of international partners that we are not anymore and uh, the mess we see, for example, in Syria and Iraq and others, Afghanistan is making good progress. All the points being raised, this is a good indicator that yes, it is a success. And I'm sure that going forward, it will be much more success. And I'm, I'm sure in 30 seconds, I cannot talk about all those reforms being implemented, but some of your questions I will get back to in terms of what we have done or what we're doing right now. So those are, I mean, the key um, indicators for the success, and I want them to look at the track records. And most importantly, 
the partners, what kind of partners you're dealing with. Someone who listens, someone who's not shy away from the problem, the issues we're facing, someone who is also willing to engage with you. So jointly together, we can address all those together. That will be benefit for the benefit of us as Afghans and also for the region and beyond in terms of peace and security. Thank you very much, Mr. Habibi. Thank you very much. Okay. So I think, Ambassador, so what do you think? Should we open it up or you want to, or you want to Put one more question Maybe to just group. to start and then go around. So yes, sir. For the, what do you look forward to coming out of the Brussels meeting next week? What yeah. will be the main messages that you would hope to see come out of it, and thus taking this international cooperation forward? Ambassador, do you want to start? Um, well, what w from. Um, oh, from the uh, Afghan government's perspective, what we hope to um, to achieve from Brussels is the um, is the acknowledgement of the continuation of the success that we have begun in the last 24 uh, months. Um, it, the fact that the foundation for those um, those progress um, has been laid, um, and and to be able to get the international community to align itself uh, behind the Afghan government's reform agenda, the Afghan national uh, peace and development framework that we have developed, which, where we'll be presenting to our partners in Brussels. Um, and the commitment um, to, uh, in our journey towards becoming a sovereign, democratic, um, and a, you know, peaceful country. Um, so that would be our hope out of Brussels conference. Okay, yeah. great. Jason? Uh, just to add, I mean, I, I uh, agree with everything Ambassador said, and, you know, it's just a recommitment, right? It's a recommitment after Warsaw when the security assistance and the security posture was agreed to a long time. This is the other side of that coin development, and it's a recommitment to Afghanistan's future, acknowledging that um, there's a lot of work, and also to help manage expectations. I think, uh, as Bambi mentioned, critically important that. This, you know, this is going to take a good deal more time. It's on the right path, uh, but and we can't walk away. Yeah, I, I echo everything that's been said. The, just to add one point to it, one of the things looking at the most recent indicators that I think is a new challenge. Um, I think the model itself of an era of so much heavy outside investment, the fact that you did see an increase in inequality, and that poverty is turning into one of the more difficult challenges. Um, so I think there should be some message out of the conference related to that. I know there's the separate conference, um, separate activity dealing with women, but this, when these are issues that, if they do become truly intractable, can impact stability over the medium to long term. So I think a renewed focus on issues related to um, growing inequality. Um, there are people, some people doing extremely well, some people doing less than well, but growing inequality, um, the focus on poverty, um, as well as, again, that continuity of commitment over the longer term, because these are very intractable. Right, and indeed the, the World Bank report called attention to the need to have res a response mechanism or several for families at risk, sort of addressing that. Okay, let's open it up and uh, take questions. We, got, do we, have micro we do have microphones, right? So people who raise their hand, hand or, yep, this gentleman hey, here. Uh, I would just like to, to ask uh, in the context yeah. of these. Could just name, name, and, name, rank, and serial number. <laughs> what organization are with? Frank this? Albert. Uh, with, with what organization? In the context of the gains that you all described, uh, I wondered if you could talk about the impact uh, on uh, recruitment uh, among the Taliban and the, the threat uh, from them in general and what impact this has had. Also, what impact it's had on the drug trade, uh, if any. And the third area would be intra-regional cooperation, specifically with Pakistan and India, and what your gains have meant in those three areas. Ambassador, hey, maybe we might take a couple, if you don't. Okay. Just we might group but these together. Other com think, questions or comments? Think of your answer. Yeah. Okay. Please. This this woman up here, right? Hi, my name's Jade Wu, and I was a former rule of law advisor in Kunduz and Kabul. It was a State Department-funded program. Uh, 
this question is more for Ambassador Mohib. Uh, Ambassador, uh, we have all seen in the last many years a number of Afghans exiting the country due to instability and violence. And specifically, I'm focusing on the Afghans that we, the international community, employs or has employed. We like to think that we employ the best of the best, the university trained, the multilingual, and for the rule of law program, those who support gender equality, democracy, transparency. I know for a fact that a number of them have taken visas, specifically the US special immigrant visa, and have left the country. So with this outflow of intellectual and professional resources, it can't be good for the future of Afghanistan. So my question is to you is, for your government, is there some discussion or program in the formation about how to make Afghanistan more attractive for these people to stay and lead the country into an era of progress? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Should we begin with the, uh, the, the, the exiting of Afghans and entry? Um, so, uh, for m many of you who've been following Afghanistan, uh, uh, 2014 was portrayed in the, in the international media as the year of the doom of Afghanistan. This would be the year where everything, would, everything we've built in Afghanistan will be destroyed. The government will not be able to sustain itself. The, the, the security forces, the Taliban would take over. The, the image built around 2014 and its impact on the Afghan public was not fully, I, I think, fully taken into account when the economy was also tanked by, by the exit of the foreign security forces, which employed uh, nearly four to 500,000 uh, people in, in provinces by these, um, uh, uh, not only in the, um, by the military itself, but also by those who were working in reconstruction, provincial reconstruction teams and projects like yours. And their departure meant there was no jobs for people, that there was no transition uh, taken into account on what happens to these people, where will their opportunities be. I think it also links back to the question we had earlier from uh, Mr. Albert on the, uh, on, on the fact that what happens to all those recruit, the, 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 the creation of the, um, the recruitment va vacuum that was created. Um, but in that period, many people who do le left um, today, um, fr from my recent trip to Afghanistan and on the way we, we stopped and uh, uh, saw the situation in Turkey, a lot of the Afghans who did go there are now returning. So we, instead of the in outflow, we're giving, we're having people return back to Afghanistan. We also have a lot of immigrants coming back, my refugees who were in Pakistan at, the, at a large rate. Uh, which we again need to be able to provide opportunities to jobs um, and, and the government has launched something what we call the um um, uh, the Jobs for Peace program. We also last week launched our Citizens Charter, uh, which was which is to create more opportunities for Afghans to be able to find employment opportunities in Afghanistan, inside Afghanistan, so they don't need to go out. But at the same time, it's also about sending positive messages to the Afghan population, to to for them to know that the international community to it continued to stand with them. So messages that came out of Brussels, the announcement by President Obama, the continuation of troops also gave the Afghan population hope that they don't need to leave Afghanistan to be able to, 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 uh, to have uh, stable lives. They can continue to be there and our com international partners will be with us in this process of developing. So I think, uh, 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 again, the, one of the importance of Brussels is exactly that, to, uh, to give reassurance to the Afghan public uh, that the international community will continue to support Afghanistan and will continue to be with us as we uh, journey towards self-reliance. Okay. Uh, okay. De Dennis Detre, formerly with the World Bank Group. Yes, uh, my name is Dennis Detre, and as Dan said, I'm formerly with the World Bank more importantly, I spent a year in Afghanistan with the 173rd Airborne in uh, Logar and Bordak. And we were working on many of these issues. And so I, my views are strongly colored by those days. But I want to follow up on this conversation about the exit. I think we must understand that people that leave their country very much want to come back. 
I've seen it in t dozens of countries, Latin America, Indonesia, Central Asia, where I currently work. But they bring back with them skills that are vital to the country they left. This is actually a good circular thing. But and they'll come back as soon as Afghanistan stabilizes and there are opportunities. And they probably won't continue, they'll continue to leave as long as that's not true. But when things ch turn in Afghanistan or continue to turn, they will be an enormously valuable resource. So I think you don't want to look at this as a negative, but as a positive. Because I think in terms of development terms, in my immigration terms, there's lots of countries that you can point to for, for which this has been a huge plus, and particularly in, in developing of the private sector. Dennis, can I just put you on the spot? You also used to be the, uh, you, had the, you were the lead for the World Bank on Central Asia. And so there's often a lot of conversation in a, about Afghanistan fitting into a larger conversation right. about the region. Could you just reflect a little bit, given your experience in Central Asia, and how you see Afghanistan fitting into centra the Central Asia discussion? Right. Well, as, as Dan knows, I have for years been telling the world that if we don't pay now in Central Asia and in Afghanistan, we're going to pay significantly in the future. And that's not just in treasure, it's in lives. So, I mean, this is a part of the world that has not received the attention it deserves and is going to be on the global agenda big time in the next decade, okay? And at the center of it will be Afghanistan. I mean, you know, I, I'm a little worried about this donor conference now that I've got the floor, if I may tell you. I, I don't know if any of these panelists would agree, but what I saw in Afghanistan was what I saw in many fragile states at the World Bank. A totally overwhelmed government, overwhelmed by money and by people like me, who are outsiders, and a, a, a people that had no reason to believe in their government because the, the coalition was doing everything for the country. Good intentions do lead down that road sometimes, so we just need to be careful. What I'm impressed with today is the sense that this is an Afghan-owned process. That's a very simple statement and an extraordinarily difficult thing to implement because the impatience of the international community, the demands of taxpayers, of Congress, for immediate uh, effects just don't fit the scene. You have to build a relationship between government and people if you want stability. Development is a generational process, no question. But stability needs to be there first. And that doesn't come by donors doing things, it comes by governments doing what they can do, even if they're less uh, impressive in a development front than what the international community does. And I think we made this mistake in Iraq, we made it in Vietnam, and we made it in Afghanistan. We took over, we owned everything, the coalition. And that's just not how you create stability. It's, you can do a good job of international welfare, but you cannot do a good job of building stability with that model. And I hope, I'm putting together a book on these because I, I was very impressed with uh, uh, Rufus Phillips' book on Vietnam, which was, I think the subtitle is, An Eyewitness Account of Lessons Not Learned. And mine is going to be an eyewitness account of lessons still not learned. <laughs> so I do hope that when you, those of you who are involved in this donor conference, tell people it's not about money. It's about ownership, okay? It's about letting the government establish what it can, it, it can achieve and keeping its institutions in the fore, not overtaking all this with money and, and donor and, and uh, outside consultants. So, sorry to go That's on okay. like that, but thank you. You're a friend of the family, so it's okay. <laughs> thank, thanks, Dennis. Indeed, there are all sorts of lessons still to learn, I think. I think we could probably all agree on that. And part of the challenge involves the first question Dan posed, that on the one hand, you need to convince people who don't pay that much attention to this part of the world or, or to these issues why we should stay involved. And then there is a second whole order of questions that come on is, so what's the best way to do that? And how do you hand responsibility over? And Ambassador, you might want to say a little bit about yeah. that. And if I could also invite you to say a little bit about the other people who have taken advantage of the space, and that are the drug traffickers, some of whom are tied to the Taliban, but some of whom are just criminals. And clearly, they've also taken advantage of this space to multiply their, their activities. And I'm sure that's not supported, but maybe just talk a little bit about that other challenge, too. 
I, I appreciate and I fully agree with the point that ownership in the Afghan government is extremely important. This is what gives the Afghan government legitimacy. So people see it as, as, the, as their government, as the one that is providing them with services. And, and it has been the focus of, um, of at least the policies of the, 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 the National Unity Government in the past two years. We just launched what I mentioned earlier, the Citizens Charter. This is a social contract between the, the people this, uh, and, and the Afghan government. But it, it was to build on an already existing program, which you may, uh, may be familiar with, uh, is the N National Solidarity Program. So the, the community councils who decide for those of you who are not aware, just to give you a, a little bit of a background, so the community councils um, decide on what the uh, what, what the community needs, and they tell the government how the uh, the development budget should be spent um, on on what based on their priorities. But then they also contribute in kind contribution um, or or in any other form to that project. So if they are building a bridge, the community gets involved, it becomes their ownership, but it also brings them together. What we have, what we have done is built on that <laughs> to, to allow those councils to be able to create a better form, uh, partnership with the government so that they, the communities are involved in larger projects with, with at least with a minimum of six different services that the government provides, including health care, education, um, and agricultural facilities so that we can provide them with jobs and opportunities. So at, at a basic level, every community, uh, the 12,000 villages that we have launched the Citizens Charter in, would have access to clean health, drinking water, because a lot of the diseases come from that. So uh, having access to clean um, drinking water is a big, uh, uh, a, a major importance to all these communities, plus quality of education to have be improved, better, better teaching, um, and healthcare facilities. But then based on whatever the community's focus is or um, what they're built around, is whether if they're ag an agricultural community, they can, they can have the government built or support um, uh, a water management system for their irrigation, um, if they're off the grid and need electricity to be given uh, an off the grid electricity um, system or if they need access to the market to have paved roads or bridges to be built and, and, and we believe that through projects like that the, the interaction between the government and the community increases and that increases the legitimacy but also at the same time is the rule of law and a, a big focus of the government has been on reforming that sector um, so we have been reforming the judiciary and, and the Attorney General's office has recently appointed new heads, prosecutors in the provinces to be able to start reforming because that's the first port of contact with the people. If people believe in the government and, and see it as a transparent, legitimate service provider to there, they will, they will put more support behind the government. Uh, I do want to, um, to go back to what, what it also means in terms of Brussels. Um, in, for, ha for us to have more ownership, we're, we have been asking and we will continue to be asking for more on budget support, which means that the Afghan government has the, uh, the, the, the flexibility to be able to spend the aid that we are given on the projects that are a priority to, to us. I, I see a couple more hands, Ambassador Ryan, if you don't mind, I'd want to hear from Congressman Don Ritter, from Pens former Congressman Don Ritter from Pennsylvania, who's been very active with the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce, been active in the Afghan cause for decades. Thanks for being here, Congressman Ritter. Uh, hi. A um, couple of things. One, I think we need to make a better case. The Dan's question about how do you convince Congress to appropriate for Afghanistan, I think we need to make a better case for the linkage between development and, as Tony pointed out in less than 30 seconds, and, sec and also Bambi, security. The security issue, of course, is the big one with the American people. Let's face it, people out in Iowa are not necessarily interested in the economic development of Afghanistan. But linked to security, they're very, if, if you link it to security, we make a better case for development. The other thing is, I, I wish we would spend as much time or energy or at least more on what are the incentives for bringing investment into Afghanistan. When you, the, the tax issue is very confusing uh, to non, what we would call non-exempt players, non-US contractors, which, which is who we want to bring in. We want to bring in private companies. 
Um, the IMF pushes for greater revenue. So what, what does the government do? It doubles the gross receipts tax from 2% to 4% on, on average, and maybe higher in certain cases. This is a tax on production. In Dubai, they made, they made the case that this is like a sales tax. No, it's not. A new company forming by some of these multi-multi-millionaires that live in Dubai that are brand new millionaires as a function of our aid programs, they need to come back and um, if you start a new company and you're paying taxes on your original revenues before you've even made a, a profit, that's not an incentive. Yeah. Um, so these, these are some issues. You've got to unwind the tax, conf tax policy confusion between exempt and non-exempt and how you uh, get these multi-multi-millionaires to come back and build business. I can tell you this. They're there, they're wealthy, and they're capable of coming back. Yeah. Let's bring them back. Okay, I also hear, so, uh, there's a gentleman over Ambassador, there, and I also see Ambassador that Miller right over there. here. Ma'am, uh, this gentleman in the blue shirt. Ambassador Tom Miller. Yeah, my name is Tom Miller. I run an NGO that does, has a couple projects in Afghanistan. Um, I have a 30,000 foot question and a 5,000 foot question. My 30,000 foot question is right before the donor conference, we've been reading continually a lot of stories other than just about security, about the kind of dysfunction in the government and the difficulties in the relationship between the, uh, the president and the chief executive. I'd like you to, particularly you, Mr. Ambassador, to perhaps say a word about that. My 5,000 foot question is more for Jason and Bambi and Tony. And that is, um, there's been talk about developing the private sector. I've got a little bit of an interest because one of our projects is a big private sector project. And my question is, um, should the focus be on export, on industries, on companies that uh, promote exports, or should it be more on import substitution? Yeah, I, I think Probably starting with the thirty thousand foot would be better. Yeah. You wanna. <laughs> yeah. So please, Ambassador, okay. why don't you go ahead? Uh, I do want to yeah. first go to um, uh, Congressman Ritter's question on um, on the on, on the investment. We have been gaining more investment this year. It has gone from fifty uh, mi uh, million dollars up to over a hundred in the past two years, where more investments have come in. Uh, I mentioned earlier the, the $300 million investment yesterday, the, the contract that was signed for a private firm to, to build a, a new dam. The, the, so there has been investments coming in. And a big challenge of most of the investors in Afghanistan have been they didn't have the, the, the laws and the regulations to pr protect their investments. Uh, so companies take into account the, uh, the expenses they will have, whether it's taxes or security expenses that they would have to incur, um, and, and then they work out their margins. Uh, but what they're, what, they, what they're mostly afraid of, and, and from our discussions with the investors have been, if, if their investment will be secure, and if, we, if the government has, if the country has the regulations and the laws to protect it. And we have been focusing on passing those regulations so that we can make Afghanistan more um, investment friendly to increase our, um, our ranking in the doing business indicator in Afghanistan. And, and, uh, and that has been ongoing. Much has been achieved. We passed at least 27 laws um, and regulations just for, um, uh, for the World Trade Organizations, for our membership in the World Trade Organization. So that would make it easier for them uh, by joining um, a WTO, it also opens um, arbitrary courts for businesses to be able to go outside of Afghanistan to have their cases settled. Um, so there has been progress in that area and we are, we are encouraging more and we, 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 uh, we thank the support of um, organizations like yours that are helping to bring in more investors. On the question of the government, I think on uh, Afghanistan has for the first time ever reached a, a, a a level of maturity in terms of its politics where we are actually talking and discussing about discussing the issues and the, it may look um, 
dysfunctional or ugly from the outside, but the fact that we are negotiating on what makes our government and where the, the key stakeholders are talking is a positive step uh, forward for Afghanistan. It's not going towards war. It's, it's political discussions are a norm anywhere all, uh, all over the world. And as a democracy, that's, that's something that Afghanistan also has to bear. This is not. Um, it, will con it, it will always continue. And I think it's, it also is a, a, as a, an indication of, of the success of democracy in Afghanistan, where we're actually talking about the issues that we, we are having. And, and that if we, weren't, if we stop talking about them and we stop discussing them, that's when I think it will be an issue of worry. But the fact that we are shows that the government is not only um, capable of resolving its own issues, it, it has the leadership that understands that, too. So, Jason or Bambi, would you like to say something about the other question? Sure. Yeah. Inward focused investment or export investment versus yeah. import substitution? Well, I'll show my bias here, and a, a lot of it is just having, you know, a lot of gray hairs over this issue over the years. Um, I think for a country like Afghanistan, orthodoxy on either import substitution or dependency on one export product which frankly is the case if you look at the list of, develop, of countries, lower development countries that are with Afghanistan, you know, they read Mozambique, Burundi, Angola, um, Rwanda, even Myanmar, many of these being either one, one product dependent or very, very limited options. I, I think you need to, the proverbial walk and chew gum at the same time. You need to both do import substitution, particularly where you have a labor force that I think, according to the World Bank, um, is increasing at a labor force of five, 400,000 new entries every year. This is incredible when you look at the population of the country. So you have to generate those jobs internally. We saw some very interesting things happen. Um, Tony, I know you did as well on import substitution. So I, but also at the same time, have those few targeted export activities that balance that out. Again, um, orthodoxy on the part of the IMF is another danger because you get into the issue of threatened deceleriza de deceleration of the economy, which we saw in Latin America in the 1970s when they went into radical stabilization mode. So I think. There are several things going on here, but there needs to be a combination of um, looking at what the needs are, and again, recognizing that the goal of at least the US contribution really, really is ultimately a stable, forward-looking economy mm -hmm. and country. I mean, did you want to add something on this? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, maybe I should go back here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you heard the expert, but let me tell you what we are doing when at least we presented the idea for having a development framework to High Economic Council. We did ask all these questions that you have been asking was, uh, should we continue with the model that we have been pursuing since 2001 in terms of economy? Or sh so what is the focus? Should we focus on the social sectors or economic sectors? The response we got, including from the president, the 70 percent will be focusing on on the economic, and the other security will be on social, on other sectors. As you know, we are a country mostly importing, and that's because of uh, the, all the uh, security expenditures as well as the government expenditures. Uh, so the focus will be now on import substitutions. We have identified 17 goods that can uh, be produced in Afghanistan, including the cement. Billions of dollars being spent on cements, while we have the potential to produce that within a house. Uh, so yes, that's what we're doing. As you know, a country, if we don't produce, we don't create job. If we don't uh, uh, produce, technically the tra trade balance is already a deficit that goes downward, especially if the aid is going to likely, definitely will in the future, will going to decline, then that impact of that will be on the currency, uh, uh, currency as well. Uh, so then the uh, goods will be uh, uh, higher uh, for the normal, ordinary citizens. Some of the questions being asked, uh, I mean, the 30,000, I believe we have made, uh, we have come a long way. In a state of, uh, you know, uh, killing each other, just disagreement and the politically, and that's good. Uh, so that, that's a very good achievement that we see in here. Uh, 
I mean, now, I think technically we'd say that's progress, right? Yes. <laughs> right. Well, a country like Afghanistan, historically, if you go and read, you have to read it, the history, I mean, and that region. So instead of having a coup, it's good to have the kind of political disagreements. And it's good, and it's good for the system. And as you go, you discuss, and definitely that means you uh, address the issues and challenges that you face. About the private sector, that's the key going forward, uh, because we have also noticed, and that's the case that anywhere in the world, no country in the world has been developed because of aid. At the end of the day, it has to come from within. In Afghanistan, it's not exceptional. So that's why private sector plays the key role. We have some responsibility as a government to ensure that the regulatory or the environment is there for them to come and invest, and also uh, for them also to contribute Rather than the private sector we had in the past was mostly providing to the, as a concept I mean, uh, providing the services to the security forces. But now it's good to, they have to uh, contribute to the real economy, invest. And we have seen that sign. A good example is uh, uh, the recent agreement is being made. Uh, another good example, uh, which the government is also pushing for it as well, uh, the law on the uh, public and private uh, public and private partnership. Uh, so that has now turned into the law approved by the cabinet, and we already received 12 ap applications from the private sector that they want to get engaged in that uh, through the PPP with the government. Yes, it's new. We have all established a director general position uh, for the PPP, and our teams are now being trained in India because they have some good experience given the context we have. And finally, about the tax uh, being raised as well. Uh, as you know, state building, at the end of the day, the contribution of the citizens, tax is a, a, a good uh, instrument for that. And I was mentioning this morning when the government uh, 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 and introduce 10% tax on telecommunications cards, and then people questioning the quality of the services provided by the, uh, by the companies. And also, you know, for the first time, and well, not first time, for the past 14 years, we had, uh, uh, we didn't have open access policy for the fiber optic, for example. But this was approved uh, two weeks ago by the High Economic Council that other companies can also now uh, get into that as well. The, the one question raised in the past about the region, about the, uh, uh, especially with the Pakistan, aside from the politics, we believe that at the end of the day, regional economic cooperation is key. We have to create that interdependency. We believe that if a Pakistani sees that stability in Afghanistan means electricity from Central Asia, it means gas, it means all different things. So that's why that it will be important politically then to ensure that all the differences to put aside and then we focus on key issues. Uh, we have, for example, the TAPI is a good example. Now we don't call it just the TAPI, we call it the energy corridor because beside it we are now working on the, on the fiber optic, we are working also on electricity and also plus gas. As part of going forward, we do have some new initiatives including the Kunar uh, 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 hydro uh, and river, and that's a potential uh, 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 project we can engage with Pakistan, which they need. We have the water, and they have the uh, they need uh, they need the, the energy. So technically, that can be another potential area that we can focus on. So there are lots of. I mean, uh, I think I believe for the national unity government, regional economic cooperation has been a good success stories. And that means that even the Chabahar agreement with Iran and India, and uh, which the President says that Afghanistan is not anymore a landlocked country, because now we have direct access to the sea as well. And that lapis lazuli, and there will be one final meeting, and that will be signed as well, and that will then connect us. And for the first time, a railway uh, train dedicated, I mean, uh, bringing Afghans goods from China all the way to the higher town. So these are some of the good examples that are happening when it comes to the regional. And we do have a side event in uh, Brussels on fourth on regional economic cooperation. And one of the speakers, again, will be Pakistan there as, a, uh, there as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. You know, I'm just thinking about the kind, we've gone a little bit on overtime, Ambassador Wayne. I'm just thinking we should probably, I, I want people to come back if we invite people right. to our events, if we say we start on time and more or less end on time. So I'm going to, I regret that we probably should, we should probably cut it off here, but please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you, Ambassador Wayne. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all.